but without the slides. Go ahead. Actually, I am so sorry. My thingy just blinked out and I can't see anything on the screen. I am going to actually need somebody else to do it if that's okay. Mm -hmm. sure. No problem. So, and Patricia, just go ahead and jump in if you have anything as well. But um, this morning, in addition to acknowledging the original people of this land, we acknowledge also the lingering impacts of colonization today. Um, and one of those is the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks, um, which is recognized by that red hand over the mouth, which has become the symbol of a growing movement, um, the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. Uh, it stands for all the missing sisters whose voices are not heard. It stands for the silence of the media and law enforcement in the midst of this crisis. And it stands for the oppression and subjugation of native women who are now rising up to say, to say no more stolen sisters. These are some of the more recent statistics that come from the Urban Indian Health Institute, um, but also these numbers on this particular infograph are from 2016, so that's definitely more at this point. Native American women make up a significant portion of the missing and murdered cases. Not only is the murder rate 10 times as high, higher than the national average for women living in reservations, but murder is the third leading cause of death for Native women. This is particularly startling because Native people only make up 2% of the overall population. Due to the lack of tribal jurisdiction beyond reservation borders, urban Indians receive less than adequate assistance when a loved one goes missing. Patricia, do you have anything you'd like to add about missing and murdered indigenous women before we move forward? I would just like to add my perspective on that it's really it's missing and murdered indigenous relatives because it's all genders, it affects all genders. The um, research and what you're reading from states, you know, women and females, but we know it's, it's all genders. And uh, so I would just like to add that, acknowledge that. Thank you, Patricia. I would also like to add, and this is Soleil, um, that so far efforts to address the issue um, in a comprehensive coordinated manner with uh, state actors have been less than productive. And a recent example of that would be the Washington State Patrol's report on missing and murdered indigenous women. They had two years to do meetings with um, tribal and community leaders and to come up with uh, best practices and suggestions. And at the end of two years, what the, the report that they provided was basically a minutes of each meeting without, with no proper formatting and without actual suggestions or even trans analyzed, um, which kind of unfortunately sets the precedent because this was the first state in the US to do that kind of a report. So it is something that is still advancing and it still needs a lot of work and it still needs a lot of interagency, intercommunity cooperative work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Soleil. That reminds me, Soleil uh, mentioning that reminds me that a resource here in Washington state that became a resource because they couldn't find answers to these questions on numbers is Sovereign Bodies Institute. They have um, put a lot of research and have a lot of information also. Yes. Um, and they actually did their own, I believe it was them, they did their own report. I'm going to go see if I can find it so I can share it as well. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Could I ask a question <clears throat> about all this? Yeah, may, can you say who you are? Sure, yeah. my name is Barbara. And hey, Barbara. I have a, hi, one of my um, best friends is a 
um, child care center owner and has been for many, many years. <clears throat> and she was telling me yesterday, and, and we talked about a lot of things, so I don't have a lot of the information, but she said that there was a, a Native American girl that she knew of. I don't know if she was in her daycare or not, it's, but she said that the mother had harmed her, strangled her so badly that she had physical appearances the next day at school. And there's some sort of child's law in Native American community where it protects the tribe, not the child. And it was just shocking for me that, that it's not about protecting the child, it's about protecting the tribe because, well, I just can't remember everything she said. Do you know anything about that? Because that was really disappointing to her and I. Yeah, that's not, that's not accurate, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a child, it's Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, which doesn't protect the tribe. It just ensures that the child stays within the tribe or within Native American communities uh, because so many Native children and children of color are fostered out to communities that don't understand their cultures. And that's a law from the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I would, say, I would say question everything. Question everything because it's up to each of us not to... Um, support misinformation and it's not fair it's not fair to the community to share things that isn't isn't accurate and um this is a really huge thing with stereotyping right because it's just like oh yeah right of course you know it's they're protected so it's really important to question everything that we hear like that and do our own research and talk if we know people from the community, I mean, yeah. Um, and if I can jump in here as well, <laughs> once again, I actually work child protection with an Indian tribe in Alaska. Um, so I do have some personal history with this. Um, like Michelle was saying, Ikwa, the Indian child, um, I don't know why I'm, I'm blanking on what it means. I'm horrible with acronyms, but Ikwa has very, high um like it's a very strict process to remove a native child from the home because it does go back to all of those years where um native children were removed for uh, to, and taken to boarding houses boarding schools um and this there was just this concept that native parents because they were like not quote unquote civilized by a by American and societal standards that they could not raise their own children. Um, so now it's a much higher level before they will remove a, a native child because they really are trying to maintain those community bonds. But at the same time, um, most native communities have a very strong emphasis on, having, on helping struggling families and they have um, family support uh, offices where like you have the child protection area of the, Department of the Native Community where like they will do like foster care and all of that, but they also have programs pre foster care and post foster care where it's like okay this family is struggling, what are the supports we can give them so that they have somebody checking in out with them helping them. Um, keep that family unit together and fixing those problems before it gets to the point where you have to remove a child so that's something that a lot of Native communities are really focusing on. Um, and trying to put in those supports. So sometimes people say, well, you know, this happened and they didn't remove the child, but what they're not seeing is that the tribe was still involved. They had somebody monitoring the situation, somebody coming in weekly, monthly to talk with the family and offer those supports of like, what is it that you need? Is it parenting classes? Is it transportation services? And just f um, offering more comprehensive services that it's not just about removing a child, but about helping an entire family to heal and stay together. Thank you, all of you. I appreciate that. Michelle, Patricia, and Soleil, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank You're welcome. You. You're welcome. And I just want to um, state that we aren't the experts on this. The coalition is not the experts on this topic. And we bring people, we collaborate with the experts in Washington State to bring factual information, but we are going by what we've ourselves have learned. So I just want to state that.
I could actually kind of speak a little bit to it as well. Uh, Can you this say is, who you are? Yeah, this is Talis Pennell um, with uh, Skagit DV SAS. And before I moved into this position a month ago, I was actually working for Washington State in the Indian Child Welfare uh, Unit doing investigation work for Washington State to ensure that the department was complying with the federal and state act. And so, um, and then I too am also identify as an indigenous woman, a personal level. So um, I, I think what so we are saying about what the tribe does and has sovereignty is very true and spot on, but the state themselves as an agency is also really trying to develop best practice to uh, comply with the act, but also to collaborate with the tribes and, and ensure that children's uh culture and and identity stay intact and so unfortunately i think that there is this um this kind of uh sometimes misinformed conception that that because the child's not removed that the safety and their their well-being isn't being thought of and um and and so and then there's also reasons as to why that misconception is exists. And I, I think the state does a really great job of trying to respect the confidentiality of the family and the children. And so information can always be present on what that process looks like. And so, um, yeah, just trying to, to really research and be informed and like uh, Patricio is saying, like remain um, open-minded to the fact that we might not have all that information. Thank you, Talis. Appreciate that. Okay. Let's um, continue if you have more resources on this issue to pop them in the chat for further um, study. Thank you, Sue, for popping in about what ICWA is or the Indian Child Welfare Act. Appreciate everybody's um, thoughts and expertise. Um, so yeah, so this morning we're just gonna center um, missing, murdered, um, and indigenous relatives, um, many of them being women and girls, and move forward to our check-in. But first we're gonna take a deep breath. I was just gonna ask if we could pause, Michelle. That's why I unmuted myself, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all. All right, checking in. What cat energy are you bringing today? Where are you, what energy are you coming with this morning? How's the week been? Again, using images and different kinds of things to help folks who experience trauma, um, just to kind of identify with their own emotions, um, and what might be going on. None of this cat energy is your um, is, is, is your energy this morning. You can pop in the chat how you're doing today as we all arrive together. I like all the sixes and eights. <laughs> Michelle? Yes, please go ahead. I clicked on eight, but I could be four too. It's a toss up between four and eight for me. <laughs> I think I'm giving, I think I'm feeling the two 
the two energy because my I get I get headaches sometimes around the screen and I feel like my eyes are kind of like that too. <laughs> All right, great. <clears throat> We're going to move uh, pretty immediately into um, doing an activity um, based on the session four from Monday, thinking more about advocacy and how we kind of um, um, think about how we bring our authentic voice to um, our crisis intervention and advocacy skills, um, how we can um, speak, you know, kind of most naturally and least um, with canned responses. And so the worksheet that I'm um, in the link that I'm putting in the chat um, <clears throat> also came to you in the email, but if you didn't get that, you can pull it up right here and it'll go straight to the activity to kind of review in small groups. <clears throat> and kind of talk about anything that you've been thinking about uh, since uh, Monday's session and thinking about how um, to do a number of those um, kind of skills and active listening skills that we talked about on Monday. I'm going to put us into some small groups. That will take just a minute. Patricia, anything that you would like to add or say before I put people in groups? Um, I just, the pro tips, always be authentic. That's so great. And just, we always believe the person that's coming to us. We're, if they don't have that in us, then there's, there's no reason to go any further. Okay, here's the link for the activity. Nope, we're doing this this activity right here that I've put in the chat, just click on that link um, or you can, from the email, it's activity one. Um, activity two is role play for later, okay? Opening all rooms, um, go ahead.
Okay, welcome back. Sorry about that. Sorry about the mix up. <clears throat> I'm off my game. Um, <laughs> so based on the advocacy skill building handout, um, what were things that you that you talked about or things that you saw as examples that really resonated with you or felt really like your style or or one of your um, group members maybe said that you thought, oh, that's a really good way to explain those kind of things. Um, of course, the reason we're doing this is because trying to figure out how we're going to explain things in ways that are accessible and provide those psychoeducational pieces as well as um, and nat natural ways of validating and normalizing folks um, is why we we kind of practice together and um, outside of role plays as well. So, um, what kind of things came up that you you'd like to share back or question? Well, this is Barbara. I, I could say something um, that we had talked about in my breakout room, and that was that in a class that I took on interviewing skills with a psychologist teacher, he had taught us that we all have the answers already deep inside of us, that we just need someone to help us bubble them out. So in reading what you have on the document, <clears throat> we want to help that person bring, you know, bubble it up. Great, thank you. And Maria is saying, reassuring them um, that not remembering specifics is normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Barbara, it sounds like you're talking kind of about motivational interviewing, right? Yes, I believe so, actually. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, the, the doctor has passed, but oh. he was a really good, a really good teacher. Mm -hmm. So learned a lot from him. I think I kept the book, too. Good. I think it'll be useful <laughs> for you. Definitely. <laughs> Anyone else have a few things that they'd like to share? Anything that maybe isn't included there, but something you use in your own practice? I know there's folks here that have been doing advocacy already, so. Reminding them that, that you, as the, ad, as the advocate, can help them along the way, but that at the end of the day, they have control over their agency and independence. Hi, I just wanted to bring up something. This is Rosemary Tom. Mm -hmm. So I find personally, it's a difficult, line for me to balance on whether like where the advocacy ends and counseling begins and kind of understanding that part um you know <laughs> there's a little bit of crossover between both of course you know as a listening ear um, and then also in the realm of self-harm we went over like number one with a survivor who was cutting herself in that case you know you wanting to be supportive but also wondering when intervention will be necessary i that's find the, that's a really difficult yeah that that was the wrong activity that i that i gave you i'm so sorry about that, that oh okay activity. all right yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna I'm, we're gonna talk about self-harm a little bit later i'm sorry about all right. that thank you Uh, Jenny says here, you know, I like the statement that asks, what does that look like? Or what does this look like We're referencing feeling supported? What feels different? What feels helpful? Because it can help bring solution options, choices, as the survivor is answering those questions that they may not have recognized earlier, right? Again, because of what we know about trauma and what we learned about trauma in the third session, and that we're building on is that those trauma-informed pieces, how we know that the brain organizes um, memories and things like that, it, and, and while in trauma, 
uh, in images, in feelings and smells. And so anytime that you can ask questions to kind of get outside of like trying to find an intellectual word or a con or like, you know, how to explain a concept to, to kind of thinking about what does that feel like? What does it look like? Um, can, is really one of those other strategies to kind of help um, be more uh, trauma informed and, and understanding that trauma piece. Faith uh, likes the verbiage of you are an expert in your own life because expert has such a wonderful positive connotation and really reinforces that I'm there to follow them and their expertise. Mm -hmm. Yep. Working with survivors is collaboration, right? It's that I know something about systems and sexual assault and you know something about what your experience is and what you need. And we need each other to be able to move forward in that when we're doing that collaboration. And as Patricia says, they are in the driver's seat. And it's really also really helpful to remind ourselves if we're getting too much in our head and in our brain to shift down to our heart, our heart communication. That's in our intuition. That's how we're going to get, um, be more connected with them. And what we need to share is going to come to us when we're in our heart and not so much intellectualizing everything. Thank you, Patricia. All right, let's start talking about crisis this morning. How do we define crisis? So um, using the chat or annotate, what is a crisis? How would you define it from your own personal experience? How would you define a crisis? Rachel says, not being able to regulate or regain control. Jenny says, oh, it's going so fast. I'm going to jump to Benny. A negative occurrence that can leave you unsure what steps to take next. And Maria says, when the person doesn't know what to do. Or, or cause self-harm. Not and um, Rachel said, not being able to regulate or regain control when we are in a situation that goes beyond our available coping mechanisms, when uh, we are emotionally immobilized, out of control. Can't think straight or organized thoughts. A time when I'm so overwhelmed that I feel utterly helpless. an event that can alter and impact one's life negatively that produces feelings of uncertainty, fear, a mix of emotions, wanting to crawl under a rock while processing. When the options feel limited and we are lost in and or overwhelmed by a situation. Other things up here I see oops, is mm -hmm. a situation in which the pain feels like it'll never go away and feeling like you're in intense danger, trouble, and not knowing what to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the things that define crisis aren't necessarily, you know, as we've kind of talked about at different times, that the way that the brain works and what we understand about trauma is that crisis is not necessarily always connected to something that might be happening right now uh, in some kind of physical manifestation. Like it's not that you were assaulted yesterday, but it's yesterday 
that you were you were reminded that you were assaulted, right? Or or different things that kind of bring that up. So it's not necessarily connected to <clears throat> an event that is happening uh, right now. Uh, it can be just memories and reminders of different traumatic events that can help spin us into crisis, um, as well as just other things uh, about just kind of reaching your limit too. You're overwhelmed with a number of things. Um, when we've been traumatized, sometimes it's hard for us to, to multitask or manage the six or seven things we've got going on that are um, making us feel very stressed out, right? And can, can kind of manifest in a crisis. I Googled it and it says a crisis, plural, crises, <laughs> is any event or period that will lead or may lead to an unstable, unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual group or all of society. More loosely, a crisis is a testing time or an emergency. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's talk a little bit more about brains because that's what I like to do. Is talk about brains and talk about what's happening in your kind of neurobiological reactions. And one of the ways that this has been really helpful for me is um, in working actually really specifically with male survivors um, or anyone that has been socialized to not access their emotions. Um, and being able to, to kind of broach conversations about trauma and what's happened uh, in a scientific way. I worked with a male survivor who went to, I was working with him and he, I, I found him a therapist and he started going to his therapist. Uh, he went one time and then he came back. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to go and see her again. And I was like, well, tell me about that. So he's a survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, and she, uh, you know, got the sand tray out. So they were going to do like drawing in the sand or, or something like that. And he was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, did you tell her you didn't want to do that? And he was like, well, no. And I was like, well, you have to, your, your relationship with your therapist is also like, you know, it's a relationship. So you have to say, this isn't something that's going to work for me. She's just getting to know you. So, so give it, give it a chance, go back and, and see and say, Hey, you know, um, Tell her what it is that you need and see if that's something that can work for you. And if it's not her style, then we'll find you another therapist. But let's, let's make sure. So he went back and he said, yeah, this isn't working for me. And so she said, okay, let's try this. And she started drawing like the picture of the brain and talking to him about all the things that were happening in, in his brain when he was a kid, how those pathways formed. And he was like, okay, yes, this is what's helping me. This is how this is how I can start to have this conversation. And then he proceeded to see her for a really long time and felt, okay, this shift in talking about these things was just a better approach for him. So we have to kind of have a couple of different things in our tool belt to be able to um, kind of talk with different kinds of people, right? So one of the things that I like is this hand model of, um, from Dr. Siegel, right? So this gives you a, a pretty good model of, um, of the brain if you kind of put your thumb underneath your palm, fold it over your fingers. So this being the face here on the front, this is the face of the person, the back of the head is back here on the um, back here of the hand. This is the brain stem down here um, the, at, the, at the wrist and your brain kind of sits on that, right? So, or excuse me, the, the wrist is a spinal cord, right, from your backbone, and then your brain sits on that. If you lift your fingers and raise your thumb, the inner brain stem will be here, kind of in the middle of your palm, and it's all protected, right? Um, this here is the limbic system, the limbic area, and then curling your fingers back over the top, this is your cortex right here. So those are the three kind of main regions, the cortex, the limbic area, and the brainstem. And then the brainstem are what some people call the reptilian brain at the base of the skull, right? 
So this helps us uh, or controls our state of arousal, right? Like when we talked about um, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Um, so this determines if we're hungry or if we're satiated, um, if we're driven by sexual desire, if we're relaxed, um, <clears throat> if we're awake or asleep. It's kind of just real basic, the, lo the lowest part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, pyramid, right? Those basic needs. And the brainstem, um, it's the section that has our fight, flight, freeze, right? Those things that are autonomic that we can't control. They just kind of happen. They're responsible for our survival in times of danger. Um, it's the arbiter of whether we respond to threats, right? Um, by fighting or fleeing, running. Um, or freezing and helplessness. Um, but whichever response is chosen, when we're in survival mode, our reactivity makes it quite challenging, if not impossible, to be open and receptive to those others. So part of the process of developing um, uh, our kind of, uh, kind of moving forward is, is that, um, reducing reactivity when it's not actually necessary, right? So this brainstem down here is, is having a lot more reaction um, because it's so stimulated that you can't access those other parts of your brain that help you um, make decisions. So the brainstem is also a fundamental part of um, the motivational system, what makes us go looking for food and shelter and things like that. The <clears throat> limbic regions um, are within here in this kind of where your thumb is. So your hippocampus, right, which we remember is about our memory and the amygdala. So this is deep within the brain, approximately where the thumb is on the hand model. It works closely with our brain stem and our body to create not only our basic drives, but also our emotions. Um, so these feeling states are filled with a sense of meaning because the limbic region um, evaluates our current situation. Is this good or bad? Um, it's the most basic question that the limbic area addresses. We move toward the good and we withdraw from the bad. It's also responsible as kind of sensing danger. And when we're stressed, we secrete a hormone that stimulates the adrenal glands um, to release cortisol. And that mode mobilizes energy by putting our entire metabolism on high alert, right? We know that with the different um, nervous systems that, you know, you are not metabolizing when you are in a lot of trauma, right? So um, metabolizing food or digesting, because all your entire metabolism is on high alert to meet whatever challenge is happening. Um, so it's very good, very adaptive in, in high stress. Um, even minor stresses can cause cortisol to spike, making daily life more challenging for a traumatized person. Um, so in that face of an overwhelming uh, situation, we can't adequately cope and then the cortisol kind of becomes chronically elevated, right? So our traumatic experiences plus those little daily things spike our cortisol just even more. It's just more sensitive, um, more reactive, right? It's kind of like how we talked too about oppression, right? If you're experiencing oppression, it's kind of those, even those little things, things like microaggressions that spike that cortisol again when you are, um, already experiencing any kind of a, a trauma or daily stress um, that increases and it be at high um, reactivity or an expectation that, um, you know, you're jumpier or an expectation that somebody is um, threatening you, right? So the amygdala can prompt an instantaneous survival response and emotional states can be created without consciousness and we act on them without awareness. This can save our lives or it can cause us to do things we later deeply regret. <clears throat> it 
in order for us to become aware of the feelings inside us to consciously attend and understand them, we have to link subcortically um, created emotional states to our cortex, which is here, right? Our hippocampus converts our moment to moment experience into memories as we uh, remember from Christy, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's testimony in the Kavanaugh hearings um, that we talked about uh, in session three. And then the outer layer of the brain as the cortex does our thinking and our cognition. This is the one that makes us make more sense, makes us rational, makes us consider our reactions. Um, it's our place of mindfulness and awareness, right? helps us manage emotions and think through our decisions. And when the amygdala sounds the alarm, this pre it's the prefrontal cortex can't do its job well. And so we flip our lid, which is like, the, it's like we throw the cortex off. All the reason goes out the window, right? And then we're just kind of dealing with this. So that's one of the ways I like to help describe it's like, because you've heard the term, the adage, like to flip your lid to, to go bananas or whatever. And so it, it really kind of works in this particular sense when you're working on this, like your cortex has been thrown off, anything that's rational is out the window and we're just dealing with this part here in the middle. And the more trauma, the more stress that we're experiencing, the more we're in that little place where our cortex is not there, right? Get lost on the way to work right? Because we're just, you know, we're in a different place. We get mad at people who are trying to help us. We, um, you know, when we're uh, just, just simple things um, can really, really set us off. So Dr. Siegel's little hand um, model can be also a really nice tool when you're trying to, to provide some of those psychoeducational pieces uh, for sexual assault survivors about what might be happening, right? Uh, and if you don't remember quite how to do it, there are little videos that you can always pull up and watch with somebody that you're working with. This is not something that, none of these things are things that you have to memorize, but all things that are good for your toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. We are kind of that jack of all trades, master of none. We're not an expert in any of these things. But boy, do we have a lot of ideas and we know where to get them. We know that in Google, we, will, we know where to look <laughs> to find the things. Hand model of brain. Enter. YouTube video. Right, exactly. And, and this, you know, we don't have an owner's manual for being mm -hmm. a human being. So tapping into these things Maybe just what that person that's in front of you will, you know, comfort and soothe them in knowing, hey, we're all human and we have these brains and this is, look at this. Um, that may be a source of great comfort. Absolutely. Again, validation and normalization. All right, Patrice, Patrice I'm going to let you talk about the stages of crisis. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna go from my notes here because like I said, I'm a little, anyway, I'm coming back today after some time off. Um, experience a crisis is not a linear experience as this graphic shows, stages of a crisis. And we've gotten to this point in our lives, I'm sure we've all experienced crisis, if not multiple crises. Um, we experience growth, avoidance, sadness, and anxiety at different times and in different ways. We just learned that if we face a trauma and we cannot adequately cope, it can sensitize the limbic reactivity so that even minor stress can cause cortisol to spike, making daily life more challenging for us. These become crises even if they don't look like crisis to another person. As a traumatized person who maybe can't find my keys, I can seem unreasonable in my panic, but the root of my crisis is my trauma. Survivors are all unique in their crisis. 
I really want to add, humans are all unique in their crisis <laughs> and their time of growth and healing. This is why we use the image of a spiral to explain healing as we talked about a few sessions back. So I love this graphic. Um, one of the things that's most irritating to me, for me personally, is the short-term memory loss. I asked my son-in-law, did I give you your truck keys? And he's like, looking at me like I'm a loony, mother-in-law's cuckoo. Um, and I had just given him the keys and I'm asking him, did I give you the keys? Because where are the keys? I can't remember. Um, it's very frustrating and challenging, right? So as an advocate, the calm, the quiet, remember quiet, being comfortable with quiet is good. So that I'm gonna switch from advocate to person in crisis. I can listen to myself and backtrack and think and calm down and go, oh yeah, yeah, I did. I'm, I just need to pause, take that pause. Mm -hmm. Michelle, is there anything you would like to add on this graphic? No, I just think, you know, a lot, so much of this, so much of us kind of moving and growing is about that self-awareness, like you said, right? It's like, when I know what's happening to me, then I don't shift to feeling crazy, but shift to feeling, to understanding how I'm feeling and then can shift into, okay, here are my coping skills that I worked on or that I know help me when I'm feeling, you know, really panicked. Uh, and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and feeling judgmental with ourselves, mm -hmm. which does, doesn't help and just adds to that layer of traumatization. Mm -hmm. And here we've got the graphic of the crisis intervention. There are two incredibly important goals of crisis intervention. They are re-empowerment and reconnection. Judith Lewis Herman states in her book, Trauma and Recovery, that the core experience of trauma is disempowerment and disconnection. So recovery and reconnection is about reconnection and re-empowerment, excuse me. So recovery is about reconnection and re-empowerment. Re-empowerment, stabilize, validate and part of the stabilizing the quiet time allowing the person the time to think and validating whatever they're verbalizing to you and that can be um, your body language your eye contact your presence reconnect establish relationships to lessen isolation authenticity and acceptance. And, and we keep coming back to this authenticity. I am, you know, we're each individuals and our authentic self is different. Be yourself. Um, try to move from your head to your heart and that will help you just be yourself. Remember your breathing. Don't hold your breath. You're doing a great job. Mm-hmm. Think about a time when you felt validated. What made you feel that way? Validation is a core goal for our advocacy with all sexual assault survivors. Can you use, please use the chat or annotate to share with us an experience you had where you felt validated? How did that happen? How did that happen for you? Robin, the phrase, I believe you. Rosemary says, when my needs were met without a time limit or condition. Benny, 
when the person I shared with would tell me about a similar experience they had, so I knew that I wasn't alone. Hansel, what you're feeling is so normal. It's a natural response. Courtney, when my best friend believed me and asked for my consent before giving me a hug. That's huge. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things for me that I find when I feel in crisis is, you know, just like ha having space because I'm an internal processor, you know, and that I have to tell, sometimes I have to tell my, my wife and be like, I don't, okay, I didn't talk about this, but I don't want you to solve my problem because <laughs> I'm not there yet, right? <laughs> so we just are able to kind of have those conversations be like, you know, she can be like, oh, I see you are, you don't want to solve this problem. I don't, I want to be in my feelings in this moment, right? that that's really important to have that space to do that. And that feels really validating. Very much so. Oh, Lynn, that's so powerful. And Emily states, I felt validated when the person I was speaking to didn't try to interrupt to convince me slash try to change my mind about what I was feeling. And Lynn said, when my perpetrator admitted to his actions, Melanie, when I was told that I wasn't crazy and didn't imagine things. Mm -hmm. Really being heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, free of judgment spaciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Honoring us when we say, I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It stops there. Mm -hmm. So as Patricia said that, you know, there's these two kind of branches to um, re-empowerment. The first being stabilization, that we're establishing concrete action steps with a survivor is that stabilization based on what it is that they want to do. Some survivors may contact us only hours following their assault and their emotion to be extremely intense or it can be extremely intense because you know their experience of crisis is um, connected to uh, to that trauma long ago, but has, you know, brought back that crisis um, situation. So there's a couple ways to do this. this. One is to establish safety in stabilizing, um, helping to stabilize folks. So, um, you know, is there, what are the needs for, um, you know, what are their needs right now? Do they have immediate medical care needs? Are they in any kind of a any kind of um, danger, right? And stabilizing can help folks who might feel like they're in danger walk through a process to kind of see if they really are in danger, right? Um, and some of that is by helping us come back to that uh, present time through things like grounding or kind of observing what in the room where I am right now to really establish the safety of being here in this moment instead of back where my memory is. Um, and then in the case of a, a more recent assault, thinking more about those, those physical safety needs or medical needs that might be um, needed through asking the survivor. Um, helping folks kind of manage those overwhelming emotions um, 
you know, we have a goal to help folks to kind of de-escalate, right? Um, to decrease that overwhelming emotional upset and to increase contact with what's happening here and now and increase that survivor's kind of sense of control. Um, we are not trying to gain control over their feelings or their reactions, but trying to help them get control over what they want their reactions to be, um, to, you know, which uh, is about, sometimes it's about talking about what might be happening in your brain or also just being in that place where we're saying, okay, right now you're in crisis. I mean, th there's a crisis, you, you know, this is clear. And um, what do you want to happen now? What do you need in this moment, right? Um, that our stabilizing strategies are typically a little bit more active and directive than when we're doing kind of general advocacy. Um, because we want to ensure that more immediate support or additional coping resources. So sometimes it's like, okay, it might be more directive for me to say, okay, let's take a breath and then breathe with them, right? That's a little directive instead of saying, do you want to take, <laughs> do you want to take a breath? It's like, let's breathe. Let's just breathe for a second. Let's pause. Um, some of those kind of things to help kind of, um, direct the situation and create some kind of stabilization. Um, but also saying, I'm here, um, let's see what we can do. I'm here, I'm gonna help you, we're gonna figure this out. Um, then the kind of other branch there is the validation. We're communicating empathy, we're providing helpful information, information that people want or um, want to um, or experience as helpful. It's our core goal of advocacy with all sexual assault survivors, right? We want to value their, um, validate their value and rights as a person, that they're worthy. We wanna validate their feelings about the sexual assault or about the crisis that they're in if it is that they can't find their keys, right? <clears throat> their strength and courage their ability to recover, right? Their sense of power and self-worth. And you all have shared in the beginning of the session today and kind of throughout the different ways that you can do this. So we all have some good examples about how to provide that validation, right? We are holding them in positive regard and showing concern for their well-being. Um, yeah real emotional support and, and more kind of basic because again, they're, they're in here in this limbic region. So anything that needs this, cort this cortex of the brain, we don't wanna try and go there. I mean, we do wanna try to bring you back here, but, but they're here right now. And when we're meeting people where they're at, um, then that's where we're meeting them. We're talking about feelings. We're talking about survival in that moment. Um, because that's where they're at. So sometimes it can be helpful to say, here's what's happening for you right now. Um, I can see that you're in crisis. I also see um, that, you know, it appears to be safe here. Um, does that, does it feel safe here to you? Look around, what do you notice? Um, you know, sometimes we do the five, four, three, two, one grounding activity where it's like name five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, and two things you can smell, and something you can taste, I think is what it is. I may be wrong, we can always Google that later. But something like that where you, where you have kind of an assignment to bring you into the here and now. That's another thing too. And even if it's just sometimes when I'm on the phone with people, I'm like, um, you know, do you have like a sweater on or, or a chair that you're sitting in? What does that feel like? Can you touch it and tell me kind of what that feels like? To, just to help ground in that moment, right? Yeah, it's a grounding five, four, three, two, one. I think it, there might be a handout in your thing, but you know. I am not confident in what I put in the uh, five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. 
Yeah. Coping technique for anxiety. I had to Google it real quick. We can also offer, <clears throat> would it, would you feel better if we went outside to the fresh air and sat at the picnic table? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Na nature does wonders. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there is a gif that, that kind of moves with your breath. And maybe that's what you're trying to share, Rachel. I don't know, but like, there are lots of different things that you can look up and kind of put on the screen and that you follow while you breathe, like a shape expanding and contracting. Also those toys from, that are like those, gyro looking things that you can pull open and then push together that expand and contract that sometimes um, those are really useful uh, especially with younger people or people assaulted as children to like do breathe while you kind of pull it open and pull it apart and and push it back together All right, crisis intervention, reconnection. A trusting connection built on rapport is very important because it will help determine whether the survivor follows up their initial contact with ongoing support. Remember that aspects of sexual assault sometimes make the formation of this helpful working relationship a difficult task. This may include those who have experienced being blamed by others, being taken advantage of, or abused by people in authority. Reconnection also refers to establishing connections with other people in their lives. This type of reconnection can include self-disclosure to others, so it may be helpful to talk about ways the survivor can ask for help from others gauge uh, trustworthiness, assert healthy boundaries, etc. You can try helping a survivor make a map of all those they are connected to and get support from. And again, to get to this point, we'll have already been paying attention, right? Because if there will be people that could present and they are totally isolated, it is just them and they've connected with your center. So this wouldn't be appropriate, right? This will just remind them that they don't have any, anybody else. So um, always gauging that for ourselves as the advocate, if this is appropriate or not, what is appropriate? And really working on establishing that relationship. Um, they, you know, as of second bullet says, Ex they can experience strong emotions addressing their experiences. Of course, this may translate into not keeping appointment or being late. And as a professional, you know, we're not gonna take that personally, right? We're not gonna, um, we're gonna keep our ego in check. It's not about us. Survivors need to establish connections with other people in their lives if they have them. Mm -hmm. Some people, don't have that. Michelle, is there anything you would like to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, sexual assault is an incredibly isolating experience, right? Uh, which is why that reconnection is so important and why, especially if somebody doesn't have other people, why we are important and why sexual assault centers um, can be important. So maybe if they don't have a map that we can create a map and put ourselves on it, right? And saying, this agency, this crisis line is this first part of your reconnection as you start to build up a community. Um, and maybe and it's 24 seven. Right, and, it, and a support group also might be a good place to start to establish those reconnections after a time. Um, but reconnecting with people, talking to another person, being heard is part of that reconnection. Okay. Taking a deep breath to smell the flower. 
and then blow the pinwheel. You can also do the belly breathing where you put your hands on your stomach and feel it as you extend it out and then breathing back in. Having your hand on your chest and breathing in and out. These are all um, hard topics that we're talking about today. Um, we're going to take a break and then come back and talk about suicide and self-harm. And then we're going to do some more practicing. Okay. So I have three minutes till 11. Let's come back at 11.05. Okay. All right. Okay, before we get started, where are your feet? Let's put them on the ground, feel the connection, the floor, or the carpet, or if you're outside, maybe grass or cement. So we'll talk a little bit about suicide intervention, suicidality, self-harm. Um, in my experience, this is not something, it, specific suicidality was not something that uh, came up a lot. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we kind of go forward. But in my experience working with survivors, it was not something that was, uh, that I encountered a great deal. Really, we are here where the star is in the act of listening kind of place in the suicide intervention flow chart. This is what we're good at. This is what we're trained to do. This is what the expectations are of us. Um, and of course, we're going to talk about some of these other things as well, but this is a place to really focus in, right, about active listening. Focus on your ability to active listen. This is the best skill that we have to offer. One of the things that's really important for you to remember is that we are responsible to survivors, but we are not responsible for them. I'm going to say that again. We are responsible to survivors, but we are not responsible for them, right? We have a job, we have boundaries, we have all of these things, these, these ethics. We have a responsibility to survivors to provide active listening, to provide the kind of things that we say we're going to provide, to provide confidential um, uh, services, et cetera, right? But we are not responsible for what survivors choose to do. And so that's a really important thing for you to um, remember. And not just around suicide, but around anything. People get to make their own decisions, their own choices. And that's important. And that's fundamentally where we are at in our philosophy. That survivors get to make whatever choices they want. Um, know your agency's policy and procedures for suicide and self-harm. They might be specific. And what we're talking about today is gonna to be more general. So you're gonna to wanna to talk through that and get familiar with that. Um, you'll also wanna be familiar uh, by talking with supervisors and other folks that you're gonna work with in your agency around who in the community is an expert for suicide intervention when you need to make a referral, okay? So we're using active listening skills. We're focusing on a reconnection, especially because Sexual assault is so isolating, and isolation um, is, you know, also uh, reconnection is also really important about the isolating experience of wanting to um, end your life, right? So we're maintaining and establishing an empathetic connection with someone in order to reduce their feelings of isolation and helplessness. Again, like crisis intervention, trying to find you know, who might you be connected to? How can you establish reconnection? How can you establish connection with 
the world or the earth or the room around you, right? Just anything that we can do to help make some of that reconnection um, by bringing people into the here and now and, and um, being grounded. If you are hearing hints of suicide, never be afraid to ask a person, are you thinking about killing yourself? You wanna avoid euphemisms like, are you thinking of doing something? That's not specific enough. You have to be straightforward in your approach and your willingness to talk about it is gonna be refreshing for folks. Again, it's just like with, with sexual assault. A lot of people don't wanna talk about it. Like I was telling you about my uncle who always like flinches every time I talk about the work that I do. You need to be the kind of person who is not gonna flinch about that, that we need to be uh, able to hear hard truths and ugly feelings um, and to be able to be okay while talking about them. For me to be calm while engaging in a conversation with you about your thoughts on, on, on your life, on ending your life and being able to, to have honest and straightforward conversations. If the client is not thinking of, of, of suicide, they will most likely tell you. Um, and it's not usually useful to try to argue or debate with someone about their decision. Uh, it's more useful to actively listen to their pain in isolation and continue to build rapport because that helps to build that reconnection piece of, um, of our uh, crisis intervention kind of flow chart, right? So active listening, lethality assessment, making a referral and arranging follow-up. So we're gonna talk a little bit about suicide assessment. These are the real, these are real basic um, principles that are used across, uh, across fields usually. So if you've taken any other kind of social work or things like that, um, th these are kind of those basic pieces of a suicide as assessment. So SAMHSA, um, S-A-M-H-S-A, Again, it's an acronym, so I'm like, what does it stand for? It's something about mental health. <laughs> I can't remember the exact, um, but they have this, um, these core principles and the lethality of a client will determine kind of how you proceed with a call or an appointment. And this, the assessment steps are, are such as ideation. So if you hear, a desire for suicide, it can show up in a variety of ways. Um, feeling helpless, hopeless, feeling trapped, feeling intolerably alone, right? All of those things are the most common for sexual assault survivors. Now moving forward through this becomes less common, of course, but because of that isolation, because of that helplessness that folks were made to feel in a situation where they're being abused or assaulted, that ideation, that helplessness and hopelessness can be very common. Capability is usually what we're kind of looking at as a history of suicide attempts, exposure to someone else's death by suicide can be a risk factor. Um, an available means of killing oneself or having um, weapons or pills or different things like that. Other capability risk factors, like they're currently intoxicated, they're currently um, super escalated, using substances, um, acute mental health issues like dramatic mood change, or being out of touch with reality, extreme agitation or rage. Um, and that, of course, these are building blocks. So you have the ideation and then you also have some of those aspects of capability. And then you move to looking at what is their intent? Is there something in progress? That's a 911 call. That's not something you wanna, right? So if there's a, something in progress then you know, you probably didn't even get to ideation or capability, right? You're already in intent. Um, generally, that's not the case. That's never been a, a, an experience that I've had um, with folks on a crisis line um, or in the office or in the shelter. 
um, plan to kill oneself where they have a known method. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to use. Um, and an expressed intent to die. I'm going to die by this. I'm going to die by this time. I'm not going to make it to this age. Um, and any kind of preparatory behavior, getting ready, writing a suicide note, um, getting collecting pills, things like that. Um, and then we also kind of evaluate the resources, which we should always do. Um, even if there's no capability or intent there, still going into the resources around who helps us feel connected, what helps us feel connected. Um, that's really important in both cases of suicidal ideation, but also sexual violence, right? So either way, both or either one, reconnection. Who are immediate support? What are those immediate supports? What social supports do we have? Churches, schools. Um, engagement with helpers, uh, like um, somebody who works on, a tel on, a, on the phone, right? Like me on a crisis line. Um, and sometimes visiting core values and beliefs, um, that also helps us feel connected. Um, having a sense of purpose. And then internal resources, like what are your strengths? You know, what, what are your abilities? What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? What are your wishes, hopes, dreams, right? Those kind of things also help foster that connection, especially when there's not other people to, or social support that those internal resources are always going to be something that we can work with, with somebody who is experiencing crisis, who is suicidal, or who is um, a survivor of sexual violence. And then, of course, external resources, you know, people in your life, things like that. When's the last time you connected with or talked to these people you care about and love? Um, to what extent, you know, do you feel cared for? or supported by them, you know, how do you feel about being able to ask for help? And do you feel that folks, you know, would respond to you asking for help? So external resources as well. But those internal resources are so important. We really want to really focus a lot of times when we're working with anybody on those internal resources, because there's a lot in there. Um, that sometimes we lean really heavily on those external resources when we have them within that we just don't know and haven't recognized. And we can help foster and bolster those internal resources through normalizing and validating, right? And positive reinforcement. You are so strong to have called me. Somebody who has called you, somebody who has come to see you, it's very, very unlikely that they reached out to you for help if they're have a if they're you know trying to end their life. But it is a thing that's scary to have thoughts of harming yourself or thoughts of killing yourself. That's very disturbing to hold alone. And so people often reach out and reach out sometimes anonymously and need other people to say, here's a weird and ugly thing that is freaking me out. I feel scared that I could do something. When really, once you start talking about it, that fear can start to dissipate, right? So never being afraid to have these conversations and allow people to say, here's the ugly thoughts and feelings sometimes I have inside. Right? Those are really important. This one's mine, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Common suicidal ideation, nonspecific. I wish I was gone. I wish I could fall asleep and not wake up. This would go away if I wasn't here. I wish I could go back to before this happened. Another one can be, I don't want to feel, I don't want to continue to feel this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and just getting out of their head, getting those thoughts out of their head, which they're ruminating on Mm -hmm. and speaking them. It's so powerful Mm -hmm. speaking them to another person and that another person is normalizing and validating is profoundly powerful. And um, kind of like, you know, an exorcism of getting that out of your head and that weight off your shoulders and getting it out there. And then it's able to dissipate more easily. Mm -hmm. Um, The most common things advocates will encounter is nonspecific suicidal ideation. Um, Doesn't meet the threshold for suicide intervention slash hold. We engage and explore through active listen, listening. And I will insert there our presence, our presence. Mm-hmm. We don't avoid hard conversations like suicide and wanting to disappear because those are normal thoughts and feelings after the trauma of sexual assault. We address them directly because hard topics like sexual assault, violence, and suicide aren't acceptable conversations in other places in society. This is where we can be helpful and not afraid to have those hard conversations with survivors. We are safe to discuss ugly topics with, Mm -hmm. and we may be the only person in their life in that moment that can handle it and not be, and be non-judgmental and be fully present and normalize and validate. Mm-hmm. And if Patricia says to me, I wish I was gone and I'm her advocate, what am I going to say? I'm not going to say why, right? Because I know why, right? Um, but I might say, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that feeling. Tell me more yeah. about that. Yeah, that feeling. And all this takes practice. This is where I'm just, I'm constantly advocating for role plays and staff meetings for new advocates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's so helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, these things being very normal um, experiences of um, sexual assault survivors or ways that they're you know, kind of talking, um, processing, um, because, right, it feels so hard. You're super isolated because that's what sexual violence do, does. But it also just like feels really hard to move through the day, right? There's also those depression pieces. It's hard to get out of bed. It's hard to take a shower. Like just things just feel hard. And so finding a different way um, or just you know, not feeling motivated because everything is such a huge challenge. There's no energy for it, right? So just kind of exploring those those concepts and kind of talking about what are those things and then trying to make those things that, that seem hard, find ways to make them feel easier or feel important um, or feel connected to feeling better, right? Um, that's a good question, Barbara, about how to handle this. if not spurred on by an event. You mean like a sexual assault that they, they are just clinical depression or something like that. Um, yes. that's, that's not necessarily yes. my, yeah, that's not necessarily my expertise, but, um, I think that it really is similar to like, again, having some kind of reconnection everything feels hard. What are ways that we can make things feel easier, more accessible or successful, right? Because we would be helping. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, Because we would be helping anyone who comes through the doors, correct? Whether it's based on domestic violence or sexual assault, if somebody comes in and they're, they just really need our support as an advocate to help them get through something such as, wanting to commit suicide or contemplating it 
um, wouldn't we be helping or would we be um, referring and just saying, oh, sorry, we can't help you, but here's some other resources. I, I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely people come in that are outside of the scope of your work um, or that don't have, you know, those sexual assault pieces. So crisis intervention is where you go with that. I'm sorry, that was Barbara. Thanks. Um, so all of these are, are the approach you'll take with anybody who's in any kind of a crisis around both the suicidal, the suicide assessment, as well as those crisis intervention pieces around reconnection and re-empowerment. All of those things will be, will be in your toolbox and what you use, and then referrals out. Because if it's clinical depression, then somebody might need behavioral health or mental health um, resources that are local to you. And if you're working as part of an agency, you'll have um, information um, through working with your supervisor or other advocates. Um, usually there's like a binder, there's, there's things to help you get familiar with the kind of resources that you'll wanna make referrals for once some people have become stabilized uh, when moving forward with general advocacy around sexual violence is not their main issue. Okay, a little bit about self-harm and self-injury, which is way more common than um, suicidal um, thoughts and ideations. These are different. They are not necessarily connected. Somebody who self-harms or does self-injury is not necessarily someone who is working towards suicide, okay? Um, so, but it is something that's way more common. And these are some of the particular reasons, right? When working with survivors of sexual assault engaging in self-harm, we use empowerment-based harm reduction type approaches. So there are, these are some of the kind of reasons or backgrounds on why somebody is using self-harm, right? Um, self-harm uh, releases endorphins, right? So if somebody is cutting or harming themselves, it releases endorphins. That can make you feel better. So that's one reason right, why that happens. It also just creates a release, uh, especially if you feel really out of, um, out of control, um, that it creates um, a feeling of, of release. Um, there's a physical manifestation of pain um, that you can show when a lot of the pain is inside. Uh, and sometimes it's a way of indicating to yourself or others that I have a pain, that I have a thing that's real uh, and I need to show it somehow. That's another thing. It's anti-numbing. Um, a lot of sexual assault survivors feel numb um, because they've trained themselves to kind of not be in their body, right? They're numb or kind of not grounded. Um, that sometimes this works as almost a grounding um, kind of thing, helps you feel in your body, um, helps you feel alive. And it's also um, can be, especially when seeing blood or feeling pain, is a confirmation of being alive, of being there. Um, it changes that experience that you were feeling before about not feeling in your body to feeling in your body. It's a kind of practice of experiencing um, feelings and being in your body uh, that there are other things we can do uh, as far as like thinking through empowerment-based harm reduction approaches um, that can achieve those same kind of things, right? We can get endorphins through exercise. Um, we can get release through um, masturbation. We can uh, have physical manifestation of pain through other types of things that are less harmful, like having a rubber band around our wrist that we can snap. Um, or um, putting our hands into really cold water or buckets of ice or playing with temperature can help that confirmation of 
also um, um, that anti-numbing as well. Um, yoga, kind of make you feel in your body and alive. Doing deep breaths can also help do those kind of things. Yeah, intense exercise. So sometimes what we can do in these situations is it, it does become a coping mechanism. It becomes um, something that is not that is seen as you know not a healthy coping mechanism. We try not to have judgments about anybody's particular coping mechanisms, but try to find ways that they might not accidentally harm themselves more or move away from. So again, we're engaging in conversation and saying like, oh, here's a thing that you're doing and we can talk about that. And I have some thoughts or ideas about maybe how to decrease your harm while still kind of trying to achieve those things. But first we kind of have to talk about like, why do you, you know, what are the reasons? What does it feel like? Not the why, but more the, what does it feel like? What does that give you? So that we can try to find replacements uh, and encourage, you know, moving away from that kind of thing. But also there's also self-harm and self-injury that are things like, you know, um, using drugs and alcohol for coping, self-harm and self-injury can also be things like having unprotected sex, um, um, uh, what else, um, eating disorders, lots and lots of eating disorders. I highly recommend um, the book Hunger by Roxane Gay, where um, it, who um, is the author of Bad Feminist, but Bad yeah, I think it's called Bad Feminist. She's an essays author, but she wrote a book called Hunger, which is about um, her um, experience in, you know, being a fat woman and um, her experiences in life, which all really stem from when she was gang raped as a child and how she started to eat to hide within her body. That's a really good um, kind of description of how survivors experience their bodies um, in, in different ways and experience, um, you know, using food or, or disguising or changing their bodies um, as ways of self-protection and coping and all kinds of things. So there's so many different ways of self-harm and self-injury, um, although cutting is very, very, um, very common, eating disorders are also very common and substance use is also very common. Um, I think there's also things about like, you know, are there ways to achieve releases around pain, like um, ways to explore things like piercings or tattoos or something like that, um, that like is a little bit less uh, harmful, more sterile, <laughs> you know, just all of these different ways to start to explore, like, what does this give you? What other things could give you that experience? that feeling, that experience, let's brainstorm some of them and see if there's other ones you can try just so that you can stay safer. And, you know, cause some people are like, I'm really embarrassed about these scars that are all over my arm, but I can't stop doing this thing, right? So, okay, let's talk about that. And let's, you know, it, cause those are all really common things. All right. Okay, we're gonna do some practice. Now we're going to use the roll cards of Maritza and Sam. I'm going to find the actual direct link <laughs> so that I don't do that thing again. All right. This is it. Should look like this. Session five. Okay. Copying the link. Putting it in the chat. Sorry, I have to be just extra today, I guess. Um, so I'm going to put you all in um, pairs when you do some role playing. Um, taking turns. One of you 
will be the advocate for Marita. The other one of you will be the advocate for Sam. And then at the end, you know, just kind of talk through it. Be like, oh, let's see, like, you know, what are some ways that you would respond if you were, you know, vice versa, right? Okay. And then we're going to do this for about 20 minutes, I think. Maybe 15, 20 minutes. All right. 